Hollywood Sunset Boulevard, famous boulevard, glorified in movie, song, and story. The glitter street of movie town that winds its way from Skid Row through Hollywood, past the luxury of Beverly Hills, and on to the sea. Where are you walking? I've seen you walking. Have you been there before? Walk down your doorsteps, you'll take some more steps. What did you take them for? There's a private in my boat, and he wears fizz instead of medals on his coat. I'm going to tell you a story of vice and of glory and how it was back in the day. The yellow brick road it ain't. It's a street of sinners, not of saints. It's L.A.'s Chance de Slize. I'm going to make it funky in the style of Super Junkie, a poet of the Angola school. And we'll ride east to west in a short that's the best. So lean back, dig the ride, and be cool. When the Garden of Allah had gone on to Valhalla and they opened Pandora's box, where the kids with long hair flipped the wigs of the squares till the party got squashed by the cops. Then the teens made the scene, Arthur Lee reigned supreme till the doors closed in on him. But his coat of many colors made way for lots of brothers like that light-skinned Hendrix named Jim. from home at some point when I was like six and so I took a, uh, a big wheel and I rode it all the way down Laurel Canyon to Sunset. That was my first real adventure. sacred places and I believe that for a musician there are very few sacred places in the Western world. This is. It's a, it's a sacred place. It's a place where you can stand and think this is exactly where Jim Morrison stood and figured it all out. It's one thing to read some jerk-offs version of what the Whiskey A Go Go was like in 1966. It's another thing to stand there and go, wow, this is, that was probably really powerful. You can feel that resonant energy. It's right there. It's, it's a living history. From Doheny to Crescent Heights, there's a lot of ghosts, you know, and a lot of history that I am familiar with. And even the ghosts from times past, I feel that that haunting too. Talking about, you know, the smell of it and the sound and the, you know, it's a very, yeah, you can almost taste it. A lot of these places are still there, you know. The structures are still there. The history is still there. The, the feeling is still there. Hollywood itself is a magnet and obviously has great feminine appeal, uh, sexual appeal, and the strip is kind of the personification of that. 
or, you know, it's, the, like, it's the one street that you gravitate towards no matter where you are because you you hear about it and, yeah, and yeah. you your dreams can start out there and you and your dream will end there you know if you don't watch your shit right yeah. it'll end right there because you will die that night you know and it will be because of whatever dream you're chasing and things was sand and hills and rings I've been through the desert on a horse with no name it felt the social milieu and the the history of Los Angeles creates a unique atmosphere for a place like Sunset Strip I don't think it could happen anywhere else not in the the way that it developed when you go back from the 20s and a little dirt road to being this glamorous pathway of movie stars and nightclubs segueing into this whole other era in the, the 50s of being kind of, you know, a semi-hipster hangout and then segueing into the 60s where, you know, that legacy continues on. Sunset Strip is a civilization for the brokenhearted, the mistreated, the overlooked, the underloved, the underpaid, and the doomed. If you're gonna die, you might as well die here. Die in front of all of us. We'll write songs about it. It was a very rough strip at one time. It was the outlaw place. It's where some of the agencies set up shop because there's no taxation. It was kind of outside the police jurisdiction of Beverly Hills and the studios. So it was always this no kind of land. no man's mm -hmm. land. In 1892, a French immigrant comes in and buys 220 acres, a guy named Victor Ponet. He then proceeds to turn this uh, area around Sunset Strip in West Hollywood into poinsettia fields. Still, you know, you have, you know, basically a, a lot of undeveloped land with small trails that turn into small little roads. Sunset Boulevard then becomes this place between the proper city of Hollywood where all the filming is being done is now a gateway to a development called Beverly Hills. Most people think that the Sunset Strip is named because of strip clubs on there, which happened later, but it really was because it was this little strip of road that went between the two cities. We are in the center of the universe in the 21st century. You see a city in ruins, Hollywood, USA, but once upon a time, it was great. Crescent Heights, and Sunset Boulevard. And in 1946, I came to this exact location with my father. And we went down to Schwab's, which is this way, going towards Hollywood. What soda fountain was it? The one at Schwab's Drugstore, up on Sunset Boulevard. Schwab, Schwab's. Schwab, thanks a lot. Yes. <laughs> the only place I really miss is it was uh, Schwab's. Yeah. Because it had the soda fountains yeah. from the old days. I drove down to headquarters. That's the way a lot of us think about Schwab's Drugstore. Kind of a combination office, coffee clutch, and waiting room. Waiting. Waiting for the gravy train. That had that magic. I that, missed that place. That vibe. Yeah. You knew yeah. a lot of stuff was born there. Yeah, you knew that's where all the, the actors went who, who you looked up to, and that you would meet a million actors in there that would never make it. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. But the vibe was. Yeah, the there, vibe was, and, yeah. You know, they, their elbows were on yeah. this counter. And, you thought you'd go in there and have a fucking Coca-Cola and get discovered it's for just way, sucking man. on a straw. Then we came here, wait for the light to change, and we went behind me to the fabulous Garden of Allah. The senior Robert Benchley had a really nice villa there. The guys wanted to smoke opium in his villa. You're the lookout. I had on my miniature sailor suit. Yeah, they went upstairs and they laid down and did the pipe. On my first visit out here, uh, they threw a party for me at the Garden of Allah. And I was very much aware of the history of the garden and uh, the many famous people and, and celebrities from the Algonquin and people from New York. It was a bohemian atmosphere, which was named for Allah Nazivimo, who was a famous silent actress. 
Her most famous film is called Salome, <laughs> and it's a beautiful film, but it ruined her because she used her own money to make it, which is not a good idea. She owned the Garden of Allah, which was a series of Spanish-style bungalows built around a swimming pool that was shaped like the Black Sea or something that reminded her of, of her past. And she lived in the large house and later she had to sell it. And that's when I visited the place. And she lived upstairs in a little apartment. She wore a famous wig in Salome that was little balls on wires that jiggled every time she moved, a fabulous thing. And that was in her apartment when I visited her. I was lucky enough to be here when I came out to go around the Garden of Allah, which is really the history of Hollywood. And that's where Robert Benchley used to stay, and Errol Flynn would have a bungalow there. And it was a great, charming place with huge banana trees, palm trees. You'd walk in, into it, and uh, you would think you were in some kind of a paradise. My first few days in Hollywood and at, at the Garden were all that I had anticipated. It was party time the entire time. So when I came out the second visit in L.A., I actually made a point of staying at the garden. By then, it was, it, you know, it, it was downhill and, and uh, a little on the seedy side. But, I, you know, for me, it still had the mystique of its history. They tore it down in the late 50s and put up a parking lot in a bank. You know, it's, it's kind of a shame. It's really, it really is. When I first came out here in 1971, hearing from the locals, you know, well, that was the Garden of Allah where, you know, Bogey and Bacall stayed. The present uh, and the past and the future, you know, it all kind of kind of rolls into one because there's a colliding, just collapsing kaleidoscope of, of, of images and, and impressions from, from past times. The feeling when you take that drive, riding a, a Harley down, down the Sunset Strip towards, towards the ocean. That strip is like where you leave and where you come back. You know, taking Sunset to the beach to go up, you know, PCH. You know, you go for a ride, you come back, and when you're going, you know, you're coming through Beverly Hills and then you're coming up on the strip, it's like, that's when you go like, okay, you know, back. Places have souls, and it, and it was very clear that it had something. It has so much history that has to, it feels a little haunted. It had the lure, but, but in a strange way, you know, a lot of places in, in L.A., the Garden of Allah, which is across the street, had, had a lot of that history, too. But it felt as though it had suddenly become abandoned. It was just sort of lost, yeah. but it had all this history, and people would say, oh, when I used to stay at the Chateau, right. but no one was staying no there, any, there any longer. Right. I remember coming there as a kid before, before you fixed it up, and it was, it was pretty funky. The fact that I live so close to it is no accident. I mean, I, I, I truly, you know, I feel like my early L.A. roots are in and around the Chateau Marmont. But back then, it was not hoity-toity, you know. I mean, the Chateau was, it was, you know, uh, it had, there was, <laughs> there was, there were a couple of layers of grim <laughs> all over it. It was a little run down. Like in room 21, there was AstroTurf. You know, you, you didn't really want to take your shoes off. But that was part of its charm. When the Chateau started in 1929, it was just after the stock market crashed. So they had intended it as an apartment house. But they ran out of money, and no one wanted to move in. So they ended up furnishing it with all these uh, furniture from all these estates up in the oh. hills. That's why the lobby had this look of very eclectic, old pieces that came from that time. So when we sort of 
resuscitated the whole place. It was very much looking at those old historical photos. And then as you went up into sort of the penthouse and we sort of decorated it in the scheme of what, for example, Howard Hughes lived there in the 50s. So it was sort of like what would be the high glamour of the 50s. There's nothing nicer for me to feel like if I'm at, say, the Chateau, sitting in a place where I know 40, 50 years ago, great writers, great artists, great musicians, not just the whacked out stories and funny stories and drug stories, but just sitting there writing a script or working, you know, maybe have, working on a tune or working on new material, whatever. I love sitting there. The Chateau Marmont became a kind of home. Thanksgivings and having Christmas and then having friends stay and it, it felt like my unsafe safe harbor. <laughs> Tonight it's quite cloudy, but I think you can see the view pretty well. It brings out people, a dark yeah. side, a kind of fun dark side. I, 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 I agree with you. It is something, you know, I think a good hotel tends to do that. Um, I think I mean dangerous. dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> that, it that's can be that. dangerous or it can be very creative mm -hmm. or very productive, however you want to yeah. cast it, but certainly the, it, it invites and encourages kind of an extreme. And don't you ever forget it, you fuckers, as the children say nowadays. You know, I've had some, you know, some really great, crazy, wild times there, and uh, some that probably overstepped the bounds a little bit, personally, where you just have, you know, some emotional uh, blowback. <laughs> Back in the 80s, in the late, late 80s, when I was living there, basically, there was this one guy who was, he was the night guy. And you'd come in at, uh, well, you know, whatever time and, uh, you know, good evening, Mr. Depp, how are you? The, the chateau was loaded with characters, you know. But you have those kind of guys still, like in Dimitri, you know, certainly, Dimitri's, uh, He's, he's a special one. My name is Dimitri. I'm the Metro Hotel at Sunset Tower Hotel. Um, my job is to create little moments, just a little snippet, a little moment, and they remember that moment, and hopefully they, remo they remember, remember forever, then I've done a great job. It was built in, this, in the middle of, of, of Hollywood, you know, on a sunset, and for many, many years was sticking out. It was one only tall building in the neighborhood, and it was nothing else, you know, and where these people, the, you know, that was apartment, and even right now as a hotel, you know, they're not, uh, these artists are not just staying for one night or two, you know, they stay for, for a while, you know, to create. Uh... Here in LA, people come to, like, hang out, it's like a retreat, you know, people will kind of actually, locals will actually move into the hotels. I think that people will come into a hotel and, sort of get lost. And I think you told me that it, w it had been Bugsy Siegel's room. At this one, one Bugsy point, Siegel's right? apartment, yeah. Right. This whole floor was his apartment. John Wayne lived right below there, what is now the spa. Somebody told, wasn't it John Wayne that had the, brought the cow out yep. on his That's absolutely terrace? Correct. Is that a true story? Yes. The penthouse, Howard Hughes lived there. I lived there. Sharon Stone lived there. <laughs> Elizabeth Taylor lived there. Diana Ross lived there. It's a suite that obviously attracts a special energy. On clear days, Mr. Marlowe, you can see the ships in the harbor at San Pedro. There are things that aren't talked about, like the House of Francis, that's really not talked about all that much. In fact, it's forgotten by most contemporary Hollywood. They wouldn't know what you're talking about. But it was a glamorous house of call girls. Lee Francis, really, she traveled the world to find out uh, the sexual fantasies that were being fulfilled in India, in Paris, in London, in Rome. It's sort of like the delicacies of sex. In Paris, one of the practices was to pour nine different kinds of wines and liqueurs into nine orifices of a woman and to sip it out of each orifice. 
Okay, I know you're counting. And all of this she brought back in the very late 20s, early 30s. And she began operating out of a luxury suite in the Piazza del Sol. It was very elitist, but people that lived on the Strip knew about it. And they were very attractive young ladies. The House of Francis was much more than a brothel. It was like a private club. Writers from MGM would take over a room and spend the evening writing and being served food and cocktails by pretty women who were smart and educated, who they could run lines and scenes by. Sharing ideas, having fun, it was a pretty exciting place to be. But there was some pretty dark sex going on. Certain people went in for the bondage and that sort of thing and whipping, and so there was a soundproof room for that. Anything you wanted, you could have there. Women often were there in the lobby, partying, eating, drinking. Women also went there for sex. It wasn't just for men. Jean Harlow had a voracious appetite for both men and women. Sometimes Jean Harlow would come for a woman and end up going home with a customer. Lee Francis was the reigning madam of her day up until the 40s. And that's when she fell. Lee was busted at the Piazza del Sol in January of 1940. There wasn't a single soul that would help her out. All the fun, all, all the high living that people did with Lee, and she ended up without a dime and without a friend. And it is so often the story in this fickle town. Tell her that you need her. She'll be there to take care of you. She'll be there. If any of you people have never seen the strip, I'd like to show you a bit of it right now. Oh, don't misunderstand me, please. I'm referring to that fabulous street in Hollywood called The Strip. It's only a mile and a half long, but there's more glamour and drama packed into this boulevard of night spots and hot spots than almost any other street you could name. Well, I thought it was very glamorous. I mean, I, oh, used, yes, it I was. used to wear cocktail dresses from Jack's and get dressed up you every night. You were in a cocktail. I was, I was. I'm, over, I'm overdressed when I'm naked. So That's it's perfect right. for me. That's right. But, you know, I remember when I was a kid growing up there, it was always so chic, and then Bobby Darren was the opening night, and Tony yeah, oh, Bennett. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of glamour on Sunset Boulevard. Oh, yes. It, it was, it presaged Las Vegas. There's a little speakeasy called the La Boheme Club. And then in 1934, Billy Wilkerson comes up, sees this place, decides that he's going to turn this La Boheme into a nightclub, the Trocadero. So it becomes the first nightclub on Sunset Boulevard. My father's Billy Wilkerson, William Richard Wilkerson II, but he was known as Billy. <laughs> he got a tip from a government friend of his that prohibition was going to be repealed. So he took a boat to France and bought like sixty or seventy thousand dollars worth of French wines and champagne. It was, a lot of wine it was yeah, yeah. So that's when he decided to build a nightclub, and then from there, his next venture was Ciro's of where we are today. Macambo, Ciro's, Trocadero, which are the triumvirate of the nightclubs, and that becomes kind of key because all the other clubs that are coming along are all kind of supporting those. And there's it's rife. There may be 20 or 30 really nice clubs on Sunset Boulevard. So the reputation of Sunset Boulevard is pretty much locked by you know from 1934 onward. It was such a fabulous time, and there were so many clubs. I loved working there. I worked uh, the Crescendo and. The other one. The the, so the way it was set, there was the cloister, then there was the crescendo, and then the interlude. They were next I to each other. I worked the interlude. That's the other one. Yeah, the interlude yes, was great. Yes, yes. These clubs were very exclusive. Yeah. I mean, they, were, they were small. Yeah. They were a lot they were of elegant. Them. Everyone Loved them. Up. You almost had to be invited. Mm -hmm. you can do a little, do a lot of it. Do as much as you please. 
When my dad had the truck, he got people to come in and eat at his restaurant. He had his illegal card games in the back. If they didn't like that, they could go to, you know, for a roulette or whatever. And then there were the exclusive bordellos up here in the hills. It was completely service oriented. Los Angeles being LA in the 1920s and 1930s, you have a police force that is easily bought off. And now you have anybody who's opening a nightclub clearly is going to be involved in some kind of crime syndicate. One of the most colorful and notorious gangsters in the United States in the late 1940s was Mickey Cohen. An ex-prize fighter, he reportedly controlled politicians, bribed policemen, and killed gangland rivals on the West Coast until 1951, when he was sent to jail for four years for income tax evasion. Mickey, you say you've never mixed with prostitution, you've never mixed with narcotics. That's right. You have made book, you have bootlegged. Most important of all, you've broken one of the commandments. You've killed Mickey. I have killed no man that uh, didn't deserve killing. And of course, it was an out and out war. It was called the Battle of the Sunset Strip. That's where Mickey got shot. Coming out from the closest street. The guy was the across yeah. the street. Yeah. And that's where they were waiting it for him. Was a and they shot, they got Mickey in the shoulder. He's out uh, going from one club to another in 1949, and it's 4 o'clock in the morning, you know? And he's out with the uh, writer from the LA Times, and she gets shot in the ass, and he gets shot. There's a rumor around town that somebody's posted a bounty on your head. Have you heard about this? No, I haven't. Are you much, are you much concerned with it? <laughs> Not too much. Oh, he had a grip on it all? From yeah, because from what I'm hearing, it's pretty hard to get a grip out here, you know? It always has yeah, it always been. Has been. Yeah. There's, there's the wild yeah. cowboy element. I took care of all the numbers on the books. I was a lieutenant. And whatever he want done, got done, that's it. No questions with him, no questions. I learned that fast. There were three big bookmakers, him and Barney the Nose and Pete Rooney. Pete Rooney, remember Pete Rooney? He, he's still going, he's going. He's still going? Stronger than ever. So he had Sneaky he's, Pete's. He, well, your club is now the Cat Club? Yeah. It was a steakhouse. Yeah, steakhouse. Yeah, Sneaky Pete's. Mickey Cohen had a little casino in the back. He had a couple 21 games back there for a while. The police were always watching him, following him and everything. So he would walk around and stop traffic because everybody knew who he was, you know. The chief of police was Parker at the time, and he had the intelligence squad that uh, didn't arrest anybody, watched everybody. And the one uh, fellow, the big guy from Oklahoma, Otis, was tough as nails. I mean, he, he did what he wanted. Otis, oh, that son, that of, a son of a bitch. He was always on my... Otis. They stopped us, and they, they would take Mickey to the front of the car, take me to the back of the car. Why don't you start running, he said, so I could shoot you. <laughs> he said, go ahead. He was a piece of garbage. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Ronnie, yeah, said. He was a piece of and garbage. And I did just stand there and say nothing. Otis. He used to call us you Dago. Oh, yeah, he was a, he was, I don't know how tough he was. I don't know how tough he was. I, I didn't care him, how tough he was. I never saw him in a beef or nothing. Yeah. Uh, but, but he was, well, he was nervy, son of a bitch. He, well, he had the badge and the gun. That's right. He had Gagadi, we had this, he had, You gotta understand one thing. When you walk into the fire and come out unscathed, you're part of the thing. And that's what you gotta expect. You gotta be careful, you gotta keep your word, you gotta your honesty to me is the best policy in the mob. I don't care how mad Mickey got, he was always honest. Mr. Cohn has realized from his experience, and he so told me, that the one big lesson he's learned while he was in prison was that crime doesn't pay. Uh, <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, Mickey would. Oh, right. When I introduced him to Candy Bar, he was in there every night. Thank you. <laughs> he, he took out Candy, took out Miss Beverly Hills. He's funny. One of the great things of 1930s and 40s era burlesque was that, you know, you had raids in the burlesque theaters and they would arrest certain performers for breaking the law and it would be the classic, like, being taken away in a mink coat, still wearing the costume. Like, it was sort of a great way to get people to come see your show. Everyone wanted to come see you if you were breaking the law. <laughs> so a lot of women climbed to the top billing by, you know, bringing the house down in whatever way she could. It was about titillation and sex. Burlesque had a whole style to it. The important thing about the strip tease was not the strip, it was the tease. And you know, it was, it was magic. This was a nightclub per se, Cyril's. They had the best acts. The combo had good acts, but this had the best. The night I opened at Ciro's. The excitement that happened could not have happened any place else. Sammy here. Davis opened up here. Right. When he lost his eye. And he came and he opened up here. We were sitting over there. And he put on his show you wouldn't believe. This place went crazy because they'd never seen anything like that. And everybody after he, the Oscars he was danced, here. danced, then did impressions, then he played everything in the band. I think he played every instrument but his coat because he's supposed to do 15 minutes. Yeah. Somewhere around an hour and 10. Yeah, right. <laughs> the Hollywood Reporter said, a star is born. My home bohemia is the place I want to be. Sammy Davis Jr. He was, uh, he was the king of his strip. People loved it when he came in, and that was the first black guy to really could get know, in there. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And he'd be, you know, dancing with white girls and all of that yeah. stuff. He did a lot of things for the first time. Yeah, you know, he's nice. so badass. Yeah. I don't hear any sound. I, uh... Well, cool it. You'll hear it in a minute. It's gonna come up as soon as it warms up. It's gonna. Warm... Yeah. yeah. There you go. Sounds like one of your arrangements, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it wonderful to have my arrangements on the playbook? <laughs> there still are a lot of ties between Sunset Boulevard and Las Vegas. And so pretty soon you start in the late 40s, early 50s, Vegas starts to suck all of the entertainment off of Sunset Boulevard. The strip had its own personality, and it certainly dramatically changed from decade to decade. It evolved, but always reflected what was going on. I personally have a prejudice related to the fact that I grew up during a much more romantic time and a much more glamorous time, and without question, I miss it. I think that uh, with the social sexual changes that I very much played a part in and, and uh, embraced, you also paid a price. And I think we did lose some of the sophistication and uh, Romance. Ciro's kind of closed down in the dark period of my fa the family and the nightclub kind of went down at the same time, early 1958. That was in my memory as a young girl, the dark period of the 50s. And nightclubs were kind of over. But something bigger was changing in the culture and it took a while to, to see it really change. Once the glamour of the 40s and early 50s started to fade, I think it was headed for a youthful explosion. I was the first television teen idol. You know, it was like, probably was like the, at my, at the height of the popularity, it's probably almost like Elvis. You know, at his top of his game. There's not much you don't dig. <laughs> Way I dig it. You dribbled out of your place looking real bombed out like traumatized. You'd had it, Dad. Do I always have to bring you on? Kooky, kooky. Kooky, yeah. Uh, birds, birds, man. Yeah. Hey, hey, birds, yeah. We all remember yeah. that shit. Yeah, remember this finger reruns. snap. And yeah. yeah. But we all had them little combs back then. Oh, yeah. hell yeah. Yeah, they don't yeah. use them anymore, do they? I do. 
Yeah, you do. Like, you're, I the, know I got you're the last. Don't left. leave home without it. Yeah, man. yeah. You got it on you. Yeah, look at it. Look at the show, man. Fuck it. Oh, that's old. That's old school. Old school. No, you don't get no old. Give us a, a handkerchief. Show them how to fucking Perfect. do that. Yeah. <laughs> the whole thing might shift. <laughs> September thirtieth, nineteen fifty-five. Drove out here with a friend of mine from New York to become a movie star. <laughs> Not an actor, a movie star. And uh, I arrived up here on the Sunset Strip, actually. Oh, this is um, the Edward Burns co-star of Warner Brothers TV production, 77 Sunset Strip, a cookie comb, and you get a free wallet photo. That was it. I mean, I would get that view of the Sunset Strip as a kid from that TV show. Whenever the show started off, you'd see this T-bird pulling up. This is the parking lot of 77 Sunset Strip. The view hasn't changed at all. It's, a, it's the same view that we had. da 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 da, -da Sunset Strip. 77 Sunset Strip. 77 Sunset Strip. Everybody thought of the Sunset Strip as being the hip place in the world. That was, for some reason, the golden highway. When we first got, we, we went, I remember us, we were all going, let's find number 77, because we thought it was a real place, you know. I don't know, wait, what is there? Is there a 77 Sunset Strip? So people would just come from everywhere because it had that magical name. For some reason, 77 Sunset Strip, it just clicked. I do 77, Sunset Strip, you know. That address does not exist. There is no 77 Sunset Boulevard. The days of the super glamour stars seem to be gone. And the super nightclubs have changed into hangouts for hippies and teeny boppers. Tonight, recorded live at the Whiskey in Los Angeles. Johnny Rivers and the Whiskey of Go Go. That's February, early 64. And, you know, Live at the Whiskey was the album that went to number one. Every night, the lines up and down the Sunset Boulevard, which hadn't happened in those three or four blocks that became famous as a strip with the Roxy and the Whiskey and the Rainbow later on. So that opened up the club era to rock and roll. And here's the world-famous Whiskey A Go-Go on the Strip, a favorite dancing spot for both the mods and movie stars who want to get it on. Let's drop in and see what's happening tonight. Elmer, my godfather, my dad told me this story. He went to Paris, and he saw that they were doing it for the first time with just a DJ and people dancing. And he brought that back and sort of created the nightclub in Los Angeles. Because before that, it was you go out and you see a band. Mm -hmm. But he was like, no, they're going to come just to hear music and have a good time. And that was sort of the birth of this crazy scene. For 15 years, I was a detective in Chicago. And I'd always liked nightclubs, been in them, been a customer, worked in them. Even when I was a policeman, so I decided to move to Los Angeles. Elmer was a crooked cop in Chicago during like that whole gangster yeah. era. Mario was a crooked bailiff. I don't know if I should be saying all this, but this is my family history. Mario was a crooked bailiff. And my dad was born in Chicago, so I think they had some Chicago connections when they, when they met. You know, I think they were the, the thugs running the night, and I think he brought the music, and together they would make this whole thing. Yeah, well, I think thing. they made their money in Chicago and then came here, and then with their capital were able to, you know, Lou was able to bring the art into that. People started coming in to LA, seduced by not just like the Beach Boys and the vibration, but like California Dreamin' by the Mamas and the Papas was like a siren call, I think, for so many people. The neon Neverland that the mod set calls home. 
Hundreds upon hundreds of cars inch their way up this fantastic boulevard every Friday and Saturday night, fighting their way through teeming throngs of people that are drawn here every weekend like moths to a flame. It can mean only one thing, that this is the place. This is where it's at. This is where it all happens. The new sound, the excitement, the pulsating fever that blocks out the humdrum existence. Honestly, I mean, you, it was so packed with kids, you couldn't walk down Sunset Strip. You had to actually walk out in the, uh, in the street uh, on a Friday and Saturday night. It was, dead, it was so alive. Suddenly, all these um, hip teenagers kind of invade the place and start to sort of take over. Mountains of people walking back and forth, back and forth, and people standing around at certain restaurants and parking lots, and even in gas stations, people would be standing around, meeting each other, chatting up, and just a really cool scene. There was nothing like it anywhere. It became a real magnet for kids, not simply in, inside the clubs, but on the street. And that became, I think, a major problem for the city. And they, in effect, chased the kids off the street. The curfew rule is now in effect. Anyone under the age of 18 years old remaining in the city will be arrested. There are at least three big buses full of sheriffs. There had to be a lot of these guys. And I could see them. They had their helmets on and everything. And I thought, far out. Looks like it's going to go bad. I can see these guys all running, but like soldiers on a run, marching run, force run, running west. Tons of these guys, I don't know, all with their little helmets and batons. And I got some close looks, you know, you crank the telephoto, you watch click, and you see scared eyes. Really, these guys were scared shitless. Because some of them were 19 years old. And they'd never been in this kind of thing, and they believed everything they had heard in the papers, that there were massive riots going on, and cops were getting clubbed and stoned and all that. When you smoke a joint, you don't go out with a club and stone people, period. The protest was against closing our club, Pandora's Box. It was like a little house in, in, on an island in the middle of Sunset Boulevard. And it was our favorite place to go. A lot of local bands played there, and, and we had this gigantic protest. And you know, in those days, there were no cell phones or phone machines or anything. We had to, it was all word of mouth. And somehow, the thousands of kids who hung out on the strip all showed up that night. And we're, we had signs, and we were chanting, and we were, it was all about us against them, you know? They didn't understand us, and we thought we were gonna change the world. It was a revolution. Well, I was coming in from Laurel Canyon, and we got about a block away, and I see kids, and I see a line of cops lined up like they were like Roman centurions, and I went, turn the car around. I don't even want to go in there. I seen all I need to see, and I wrote for what it's worth on the way back. People were really running by me. I hid behind one of those uh, cement stanchions for a light post so people wouldn't hit me as I was photographing what was going on until so that I was ripped away from the, the lamp post and this young cop with his baton wacky tried to hit my cameras and uh, handcuffed and pulled off to one of the buses, photographed with a Polaroid 1A. As so I looked at it, I thought, did they reserve this for me? <laughs> Is this the position they're giving me? Far fucking out. All right, I don't like this, but here I am on the bus. How do I get out? So Shaq and I am in the bus, or handcuffed. And I looked out the window and I saw Bob Denver and his wife Maggie. So I thought, screw it. I took my handcuffs and I banged them against the chain that was up against the window, enough until he looked up and yelling, get help, call somebody. You hear the legends of Sunset Strip, and you hear the, well, of course, the riots would put it on the map, I think. But it was all part of that whole 60s revolution, music revolution, and, and it all seemed to come out of LA. 
I mean, a lot of the people that uh, the beginnings of rock and roll with not uh, show business backgrounds, you know, we were babies in that sense. You know, we were trying things, you know, because uh, we didn't have any rules. You, you didn't know that you couldn't do that. You didn't know that you could do Pee Wee Herman on a Monday night and you could do uh, you know, Bob Marley and Cheech and Chong the rest of the week, you know, so. Uh, we just mix it it's up. It's fabulously freaky. Rocky Horror, Pee Wee Herman, the, they all did stem from music, though. I mean, there there is this culture of music on the strip, and I think that box is not this big. It's, it's, it's really this big, and I think you're able to fit a lot of stuff into it. At the bottom of it, there's a song there. I think as a musician, what we learned about this building and a lot of what was going on in this area were, was the art of sharing. And our musical legacy of certainly Fleetwood Mac was greatly affected by, by being more open, less judgmental, and entertaining that anything could go. And I learned that here. You know, we learned that here. That's how it was in those days. You could actually sort of make a living at these places, playing every night. And you really got to hone your uh, songs in front of people, which was great, because you can see which one works and which part of one doesn't work. And uh, that's why our first couple albums were so good, because we really had them down to a T before we went in to record. You know, over the period of a year or so, playing the songs every night. when your house band is Jim Morrison and the Doors, or Love, or the Buffalo Springfield, or Iron Butterfly. I mean, that was pretty amazing. You know, rock gods are walking the earth here. Rock gods filled this room, and that's, that will never happen again. You know, this small space, I saw The Who play, Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin. I mean, in this small, tiny little space, The Who. Can you imagine how, how they filled it up? I mean, it was just, you were pressed against the wall, you know? <laughs> this booth right here is the Moms and Papas booth where they would hang. But right where you're sitting is where I was sitting the night Hendrix played for the first time in L.A. And it was amazing. Everybody was standing on the table, so I, I, you had to stand up in order to see him. direct from the heart of Hollywood, the heart of rock and roll, and I really mean that today because look where I'm standing, in front of the Whiskey A Go-Go, Hollywood's rock and roll landmark. Every 24 hours was like a month because so much was crammed into it. Every minute, honestly, I'd get up that day and I had no idea what was gonna happen. And it was always anything can happen day. I think we should take a little walk over here to the Rainbow Bar and Grill. Now this is where everybody winds up every night of the week to just rock out, hang out, have a wonderful time, and just get loose. First time I came to the Rainbow was like 73, the year after it opened. If you've been coming here for a while, you get into it, you know, the ambiance, if you'd like me to say an artistic word for it, the ambiance of the place, yes. It's, uh, it's got a lot of history in it for rock and roll, you know, I mean, it's, it's the whole history of rock and roll, just about, you know. And uh, it goes back even further than that. I met G Judy Garland, met Vincenti Minnelli here. And Joe DiMaggio met Marilyn Monroe here, you know, when it was that Italian restaurant there. Right? Sinatra and Dean Martin used to hang out here, so it goes back a long way, you know. You know, I used to park my bike outside the Rainbow on a, on a Friday and Saturday night, and literally just sit on the bike and 10 minutes, there'd be a bird on the back and I'd be off. We'd be getting blowjobs under the table at the Rainbow. It's a fucking dinner place, you know? Like, what is, like, I can't, and because they had these little nooks and crannies, or you could creep, go back in the corner and 
you'd be having a just a raging party and nobody would ever come by and be like, you guys can't do that here, are you crazy? No one would say anything. The bathroom, the under the tables, out in back, in the alley, like nobody, like I can't even imagine that happening right now. I mean, I had my cock sucked everywhere, behind the Roxy, in the bathroom of the Rainbow, behind the whiskey, you name it, there weren't one place I didn't get me cock sucked. Nothing mattered. There wasn't AIDS, there wasn't, you know, people just ripped it, man. <laughs> Hyatt House was the party place. I don't know if anybody actually, I think they got rooms just to go from party to party to party to party to party. And it was, it was like the old west. There was no law at the Hyatt House. You'd go to any floor, get off the elevator, and there was some kind of party going on. And you'd go to the next floor and there was another party going on. But this was 24 hours a day. It was the insane asylum. I am under the influence of a dangerous drug, and I'm liable to flip out at any moment and kill you or myself. LSD does funny things. And they were, they were looking and laughing, and I, and I went like this, and I said, shut up. I squirt every one of you with tear gas. We have to do something to them. Two flipped out groupies kill pop star. Wouldn't that be something? It was, it was called the riot house, you know? I mean, uh, with the crazy stuff that went down there, it was, it was like, when, when, when in, in in England, when you when you, when a, a a guy meets a girl, he take, asks her out and goes to the movies. Well, eventually things happen, you know. No, you know, he's just straight in the sack, you know. You know, he's just like, wow, what disease have I got now? <laughs> I stayed with Led Zeppelin there a lot, and they had the entire sixth floor. They always rented out the entire sixth floor, and you know, took over. Everyone knew in Hollywood that Zeppelin were in town, and those guys were so fucking wild. They'd abuse the chicks. They'd like to push it to see how far they can go, burning them, cutting their hair off, handcuffing them. I mean, you know, leaving them handcuffed for a couple of days in the room. And they'd be riding motorcycles up and down the hallway at the Continental Hyatt House and to these wild, wild parties. Up all night, and throwing TVs out the window. All that stuff was true. My Led Zeppelin didn't like us at all. Richard, Richard Cole, he took this leather strap and he started beating me, and I didn't even know him. They threw Cynthia in the swimming pool and ruined all her velvet clothes. Uh huh. They were really weird. Hostile. They were probably the worst, but there were many that abused loads of people on the strip. But that would never, ever, ever have been tolerated anywhere else but America. And America, they were like, oh, do you want to hit me some more? Do you want to burn me? Do you want to fuck me with a fucking, you know, rod of iron? We'll do it. And that, that's how it was. If you stay insane and you stay in a magical place and you float, you're not going to ever die. Don't be afraid. Come on in. I needed bars, I needed clubs, I needed places like this to feel like there was a purpose to what I was doing. I mean, it's hard enough to think that there's a purpose for anything when we're spinning around in infinity, so forgetting about that shit, I got a little scared for a second, didn't you? I know you did. This is a frightening profession. I, I was a schmuck. I could have been a caterer. I realize now. Uh, <laughs> nah, I don't want to be negative. It's too hot. It's too nice up here. Uh, I am. I'm, look, I gotta tell you something. My mother lives in Jersey. How did she get the Roxy backstage number? It's really unbelievable. I just tell. Thought... No one knows where the fuck we are. We don't know why we're even doing anything. You think so? Anyway, it's good to have a clubhouse, and there were a lot of clubhouses on this strip. When this was Ciro's, I'm telling you, this place was jumping. The thing that the different eras had in common 
where you had cocaine, you had young people, you had alcohol, you had uh, Keeps going free more drugs. And it's, you know, but that's what that's what made the, the place the, the people who the people who made this thing happen. The, the public came to see all of us. We were all crazy. But I was studying for the ministry. I, I had no idea what you're talking about. The comedy store. I mean, walking in there when you're 20 years old and you're, you know, like this kid from Iowa and seeing those names on the wall and the pictures and, and there's Letterman and Robin Williams and there's Steve Martin and, and it, it, it's just, it's just impossible. It's impossible that you are there. There was a method to the madness. You had a place to work. You had to fight to be a part of it. You had to fight to be a part of it. You had to be good. And that's good. why the people packed this place. When Pryor would play here, you know, on like a weekend, it was like, it was like attending a, a, a heavyweight prize fight in Vegas. I was a cocktail waitress at the Comedy Store from October of 1980 until October of 1981. And that was the explosion of stand-up comedy. Please stay away from me. This man's a genius. Now, who else can take all the forms of comedy, slapstick, satire, mime, and stand-up, and turn it into something that'll offend everyone? <laughs> Richard Pryor was at the Comedy Store every single night back then, preparing for his film, Live on the Sunset Strip. He was the god that we must all obey. Whatever he said went. Thank you. I want to know the two people, the two people who first did coke, and one looked at the other and said, we're not going to tell anyone about this. <laughs> I think it was me and Richard Pryor. <laughs> <laughs> you know when I first you? came out, it was Sam Kennison and those guys, and they had guns, and they were always doing coke, and uh, I'd never seen it before. And I thought, I thought man, this stand-up's a lot tougher than I thought. <laughs> I think I did too much! Oh, oh, I did too much! Oh, no, I don't, uh, I don't do drugs. Was it Kinnison or, or Dice? So somebody shot a car. Like, or Dice something. didn't do it. It was Kinnison. Kinnison. And people, you hear these stories of bulls of cocaine and stuff, and you say, that's bullshit. You know, that's bullshit, that's whatever. But no, they actually, that happened. Yeah. And then listen, people started getting greedy. Listen, listen, you think that they're ballers now? These kids now don't know what balling is. They don't know. That stuff was pure, and they had it. These kids and, today, they don't know no, drugs. No, they don't know. Look, they, no, they would. And they would, I would be in limos and with Richard and with the gang, and they would, I mean, they would have $1,000 bills. They would put the cocaine and snort it mm -hmm. and pass it around. When it got to me, I'd wipe it off and put the money in my pocket. I, I, I was so rich during that whole area. I loved it. It was the best. I believe him. Yo, free cocaine, come on in. You know, I used uh, the strip for many other things that had nothing to do with my craft. The strip, you know, for me, was a source of, uh, it's hard to, to, to delineate what was just fun and recreation and what was like, I should die tonight, but I made it through, you know. John Belushi careened at a breakneck pace between the irreverent and the outrageous. It was not only his comedy that was unpredictable, there was always a strong sense that the act was a reflection of the man, and the man a bizarre reflection of a generation. Now John Belushi is dead. The Chateau Marmont sits just above Sunset Boulevard in the Hollywood Hills. It is a landmark in this town, a hotel where many actors stay while in Los Angeles, and where some live. John Belushi was among the hotel's frequent visitors. He had checked into Bungalow 3 last Sunday, and it was in the bungalow's master bedroom where Belushi was found dead just after noon today. We were kind of excited that Belushi was popping in, and then he did come in, and he just looked like shit. He just looked like hell. He was trying so hard n not to do coke. He actually had to hire people to keep people with drugs away from him. March 5th, 1982, my partner uh, passed away. 
uh, or was, was taken by a, what we can say is an accidental uh, drug overdose. You know, Belushi was a war horse. He could smoke more than anybody else. He could drink more than anybody else. He could eat more than anybody else. He could take more drugs than anybody else. And Belushi died? I mean, people were freaked. And Richard Pryor was one who was freaked. And Paul Mooney, who had, his writer and dear friend, who had tried so hard to keep him sober, um, had Richard up against the wall saying, man, don't you get it? This is what they're saying about you. Everybody thought that would be you. Richard Pryor was on the wagon, which was clean. I know what that means. I've been on it a couple okay, times. Okay, good. Well, Lucy came in, loaded out of his mind, came up to me and said, is Paul Pryor coming tonight? I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm at the Chateau Marmont. Tell him to come into the house, and blah, 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 blah. And then he left, and then Richard came in, and I gave the message. I said, Richard, don't go up there to the Chateau Marmont, because they're all up there, and you're on the wagon, you'll get off it if you go So up you saved Richard Pryor's life. Yeah, and I said, go, no, I said, go home. And he did go home, and that's for real. He went home, and the rest of home. it didn't happen. Yeah, Richard would have went up there and been in the middle of all of it, too. I don't know what uh, to say to you, you know? I mean, I see you here, you all look beautiful, and I'm sober. And it's a real strange feeling uh, being sober, because I got nothing to do tonight but go to sleep. Well, there's two instincts we have, the instinct to live and the instinct to kill ourselves. You do know that. That's for everybody. Living or dying in L.A., it all happens here, it seems like. Hey, man. What is this place? I got something better for y'all. <laughs> you feel as though Jack Kerouac was down in Venice Beach, you know, or Jim Morrison was over here and Otis Redding was over there and you feel like, yeah, I'm part of that and it's sort of true and you're sort of blowing smoke up your own ass, so. But I think everybody had a sense that we were doing something. Punk rock bands, between 77 and 80, you were making a flyer or you made a fanzine or you were writing for Slash magazine. So in that way it was very bohemian because people had jobs but they that was secondary. It was pretty crazy. It was pretty scruffy, you know, it was a lot of runaways. We were totally outside of society and all the bands were in the fans were and we didn't fit in anywhere. It was clickish, but it was still us against them. So the clicks would unite against people from the outside, and there was, I think it was more supportive. If one band succeeded a little bit, that was good for all of us, you know. We'd be at a show and we'd say, what's happening tomorrow night? And everyone would congregate at that club the next night. They'd have X, you know, the bags and the weirdos and, and the germs and stage diving. <laughs> it was packed, a lot of noise, loud. Angry, violent germs. X were good, though. But it was, a, it was an angry, violent yeah. scene. In the punk rock days, hanging around, the police would come and clear everybody away. You know, they like, they seemed to like the hair bands because they, I don't know, they were, girls wore skimpy clothes and the guys were loaded. I don't know what. <laughs> It turned from the punkers walking the streets and everything into like the, all the rock bands, like over a summer. I mean, those were the good days because it was all new, you know? We were just, there's Sunset Boulevard. Have at it. Between the Roxy and the Whiskey, it was just like a parade of freaks walking up and down the sunset. Metalhead! 
the rainbow being kind of the epicenter of the whole thing, the meeting place. So there was like a whole scene of people just like walking from show to show, coming here to get a drink, going to another show, and it just, it was like a, uh, a street festival every night. Yeah. I mean, there, there was a time when hanging out in front of all the venues was probably more fun than actually being inside. I mean, I would say the street life of Sunset Strip was really, really happening in the 80s. All through the 80s, actually, it was great. You didn't have to go anywhere. You could just walk down the street, and it was fun. Everyone was hanging out, flyering. It was good. Poodle heads on the strip. It was a nightmare. There it was, was like, it was. This is mm. post Motley Crue now, so it was a nightmare. Pay to play, that whole fucking nightmare. Mm. Just when so everyone would what like. Year? This like is 1988. 88. That's 88. when I, yeah, I moved when here it, in that's 88. It, that's when I moved that's, here. That's yeah. when like that's when every the idiot wearing magic every, 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 every. Playing the Roxy, April 7th, headlining. We have pins for you. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta wear them. There you go. That's yeah. the band scene. You, you really, if you wanted to come to LA and you didn't have anything to do, you just come to the Sunset Strip and there were so many Talk people. Talk to people. And people and... dressed crazy, you know, of all different types of rock genres. It's, it's like two, two many long nerds. It's no more too much, and death Too much rockers. spandex, too much of the same yeah. thing. Too many glam, too many glam dudes. And, yeah, know, yeah. But it's basically just all sex. Yeah. It's all yeah. sex. Yeah. That's yeah. the basic meaning yeah. of the strip, yeah. sex. Sex and rock and roll, it's yeah. total decadence, you know? Total sex and decadence, you know? There was that one point in the in the 80s there where, like, people kind of stayed away from the strip because it was so that, like, glam rock era thing, you know what I mean? So if you didn't have teased hair or whatever, they had kind of taken over this whole part of the strip. For, well, I think that's where we all hung out here, because yeah. we, we weren't in that scene. You know? Yeah, so we had to have yeah. a little place to, you know, hide we were out. We lost in the... Yeah. You fucking broke it! You fucking bought it! Give it up for Steel years we've been on the Sunset Strip every single we're the longest running heavy metal weekly show in the history of the Sunset Strip. I want to fuck some bitches tonight. Two, three, four. Uh, like that. That's, That's fucking awesome. If you're in a heavy metal like we all four are, this is the only place to be is right here. Right. You or know, during the day you could if you're not doing anything you could go to the zoo. It's just a place where you can come and fucking you know, be free. Be whoever you want to be. You can wear like lip gloss if you want. Yep. I wear sparkly kind of lip gloss because sometimes the lights glisten off it. it Plus, like... it that the glistening actually comes off on some of the cocks that you saw. You're an asshole. Glistening kind of cocks. Glistening in jail. <laughs> Is that his other band? Uh, he's in a solo band. It's called Glistening Balls. <laughs> <Not anyway>. Awesome. <laughs> thing happened, all the hair bands, a hundred of them. And I was actually, I got into that whole scene. I had long hair, the Harley Davidson, I was in shape, and I had a couple of solo albums out. And, um, you know, this is pre-AIDS, and all the birds looked like strippers, and it was great. Doing. It was rocking. There were people just up it, and down it, the street. Everyone was crazy. Out fly. It, I mean, that it wasn't was my scene. Time. I wasn't in that kind of band, but I lived around here, loved it around here always, and that's what was going on at the time. It was truly rocking back then. All the bands were kind of in like a community, handing out flyers at the next show. And every bar had something going on in it. That went on for about four, four years, maybe yeah. three or four years, and then it was and, positive. And then yeah. Nirvana came along, and it all ended. And the whole grunge thing, dirty looking people started. And, and just, yeah, somehow 
grungy and somehow gave the perception dreads. that it was uncool to be, <laughs> you know, here. Which was it's all this. We oh, all know it's man. all the same stuff. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, instead of spandex, it's flannel. It's all the same. It's. But that is a time, and it's because people dying of drugs and people getting AIDS that this that time is just gone because I mean when you hear the term sex drugs and rock and roll that was it I mean that really 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 was it you know that was the last time it was like that almost. and people won't you know now it's not cool to say hey you got drugs and you're like okay you're a weirdo it felt real hollowed out like people come back be like you guys want to do some blow and be like no and they'll be like kind of depressed like nobody party with you know Grunge at that time, although it seems very kind of cozy and cute now, completely annihilated everything that hair metal stood for. It was sort of a joke. It was like more like cartoon characters coming through the door, you know? We didn't want to be part of the cartoon. We were sort of blowing the cartoon up. And so, yeah, we, the Sunset Strip we encountered was, was the sad face clown version of it. You know, like, oh, it used to be so fun. Now it's not fun anymore. When grunge took over metal, and it did. It really knocked it out. We were kind Why of... Why do you keep saying that? It's like... You because it's, it's keep really... Reminding you. It's like having... Being dumped by a girlfriend and then but, somebody keeps bringing up how you got dumped by your girlfriend. Well, this is how... It's been me, 20 let, fucking years. I don't want to hear that anymore. Let me finish. Jesus. I swear. I see people walking up and down Sunset Strip and I'm like, seriously, have you been in a fucking time capsule? Like... I mean, there's been so many... There was so many different generations of things that have gone on in music and... and things that have happened, but you still stuck in like 80s hair metal bands. And that's kind of what I love about this trip because it's, you know what you're getting. What I wanted out of the Viper Room, I mean, first and foremost, wouldn't it be great to have a place that you could go to where you weren't necessarily um, on display all the time or you didn't feel like a, uh, a novelty, you know. Um, you didn't have to sneak in and sneak out and, you know, hide and all that. And you could listen to the music, you know, that you and your friends like. And we wanted to hear Louis Jordan and we wanted to hear Cab Calloway and we wanted to hear uh, you know, Old Blues, Robert Johnson and, and uh, Howlin' Wolf. So that was the initial thing, you know. Let's, let's make this place feel like it, uh, like it should have been, or like maybe it was back then, you know, in the 30s. A speakeasy. It was called the Melody Room then, which is like at that time, I mean, the people that I heard that had played there were like, you know, Charlie Parker, uh, Coltrane, you know, all these amazing, amazing uh, uh, players from back in the day, you know. So, um, yeah, we were, we were all very excited about the, the, uh, the history of the place. It was a really cool time. It was definitely something that was so different. The Viper Room paved the way for everything, for where I am today with, with the Pussycat Dolls. There's something so amazing about the intimacy, performing for such a small crowd, and every single person is just feeling it. The Pussycat Dolls started as an underground cabaret act, really. I remember Johnny saying, this is why I opened the club. This is." I, w I wanted this, you know, and it had only been open for like six months. He said, I'd love for you guys to come and perform here and maybe you can do like once a week kind of residency. And I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. And that's how it started. And then we were there for 10 years. Johnny helped me live out my dream. And it might sound cliche, but it's, but it's real. That is, that is real. Young film star River Phoenix died early today outside a popular West Hollywood nightclub. Among the film's 23-year-old actor star... He came with his girlfriend and his guitar. He wanted to play music. Uh, you know, for me, I mean, it, it, you know, you couldn't erase what had happened. You couldn't erase the, the memory. You couldn't erase the tragedy. And also this, this place that was, you know, basically just a, a bar, a club that started for all the right reasons, you know. Suddenly there was this cloak over it, you know, this... I mean, talk about mystique, talk about, you know, the idea that 
like, wow, you know, there's something weird at the Viper Room. You know? It became this kind of dark entity for a lot of people, you know, this mystery that they, you know, you know, thought, oh, there's, there's something evil there, there's something weird there, you know. And when Johnny Cash came in and played in uh, 94, I believe it was, the play, it was like a great cleansing. It was like he'd performed this, this exorcism. I got a friend named Whiskey Sam. He was my boonie rat buddy for a year and now. He said, I think my country got a little off track. Took him 25 years to welcome me back. But it's better than not coming back at all. Many a good man I saw fall. And even now, every time I dream, I hear the men and the monkeys in the jungle scream. Drive on. It don't mean nothing, it don't mean nothing. Drive on. You really start to have a history with these people and it, you see people come, you see people go, you see people sadly die, you see people succeed and, and it's all, it's all happening in one place. Thirteen men and me, the only gal in town. You know, thirteen men and me, the only gal in town. This club means so much to me because it was not only on the Sunset Street, but it's the first place I ever actually sang in my life. I won't tell you where I've been. I did everything for the first time on Sunset Strip. Everything. Everything. I even feel like I probably, yeah, I lost my virginity on the Sunset Strip, even. And I had my first getting drunk. I went to my first club. We weren't Hollywood kids. We were Sunset Strip kids. Going out on the sunset strip. Yeah, you're hot, girl. It's all paparazzi down here. We all used to be able to roll around, and the guys that moved up here and got their houses here, you, you weren't worried about being followed home. You didn't worry about where you lived. You had people over. It's just it was it was still pretty. Provincial, and I've seen plenty of people become uh, prisoners of their own whatever, but I, I also do think there is a debasing of it on the strip. The paparazzi culture and the tabloid culture has changed everything. You leave your house now, you go to get a hot dog, it's a press junket. So a lot of folks don't want to go anywhere. Is what it is and I came up here and I call this home and so even if it was just a bunch of burned out shop windows and whatnot I'd still feel a sense of, of belonging here and all that I think one of the, the biggest things that changed you know Tower Records closing that was that was a major that was when you really had to accept that things had changed massively in this town that was the, the Tower Records even from when I was a little kid was you know like almost a home away from home and a lot of people Tons of people sort of identify with Tower Records as, as being, you know, the music store that we all used to hang out at. There was conversation, community. There was something in like driving out of that parking lot and just holding up the CD on my way out when my friend was going in and being like, I got it, you know, and that was, you know, things were, were more local. They were more in, you know, right here. 
Tower was much more than a record store. It was really a haven for music lovers everywhere. Just seeing the listening booths, seeing the uh, immersion in, in, in music, it was so uh, special. So that the original Spago right across the street, I would go there with my family or colleagues and immediately go into that parking lot and, and spend an hour or two hours there. When you're used to seeing a certain building with a certain color on it, and you, it's there, that, it's, it's, it's embodied in your, your psyche. And you go there and it's just gone. It's like, what happened, you know? It's like a, somebody blew it up or something, you know? It was, it was sad, very, very sad. When Town yeah. Record closed, I think, that was definitive proof that Sunset Strip changed forever. The places do go every 20, 25 years. They're, the same places ain't gonna be there, but the street's gonna, you know, always connect to heaven or hell or where you're gonna go. I could have ended up living in Ohio and my dad owned the, the hardware store on the corner and he said, son, get down here, you're on the register today. And it just happened to be on Sunset Strip and Guns N' Roses was playing. The artist, the manager, all those people should be treated better. That was why the Roxy opened. But Elmer had done that at the Whiskey for years before that. And Nick has seen it, seen how it was operated. And it was very easy for him to then be that kind of a club owner. Then at the end of the day, you have the Rainbow, which is which is a combination of our family, and you have the Roxy's a family business, and the Whiskey's a family business, and Tomasa, the Japanese restaurant, is a family business, and believe it or not, Hustler, they live in the community, they're a family business, and the Cat Club's a family business, and not for a year or two years or five years, but for 20 years and 30 years. It's like this tree and the roots of this tree and how this handful of families have now our generation led to our kids' generation, and then it's going to go again, hopefully. So it's like all these generations of us have grown up together. If you were to do like a family tree of sunset, it would be very incestuous. I think we all kind of realize that we are a family, and it's pretty cool to see, you know, the clubs initially made the strip. Now, it seems as if the strip and its history is making the clubs. I think we were kind of forced to make it something that we thought was cool and something that we were all into and not something our parents showed us or grandparents showed us. It was like, we want to make this our thing. It took for a new generation to come in and make that happen. And yeah. I think for a while, we were a machine and we were churning. It just kind of wore on itself and then we kind of looked and was like, oh, well, we actually have to like start discovering music again. It seems like there's a, there's a new iteration of the essential fantasy of what the Sunset Strip represents every few years. I don't know whether there ever will be again. We're now at a place where it's, it's sort of sponsored and commodified and the Sunset Strip has, has, has just become like a kind of museum in a sense. I'd love to think that it could be revived and reborn in some way, but I'm not quite sure how that's going to happen. I've been playing this, on this street now almost 20 years. It's not the same as just playing another show in a city. It's a place where you can measure things against other things. Maybe that's not always a public understanding, but personally, it, it means something. She's probably like some rumbling going on under there, and it's going to burst out again any time. It has to, because of the incredible history and energy that's 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 boiling up underneath here and I'll always be here. It was creepy and exciting, really dangerous, you know, like tonight we're gonna bring a little bit of that back, man. We're gonna suspend some women from the ceiling by their flesh.
person that comes in tonight and is standing in the front row and is looking at their favorite artist and they can't believe that they can touch their shoe and they can they can hold their hand and that's all that matters that one moment you know and that moment will live with them forever and you know they'll look back and say it's never going to be like that you know it'll never be that great but in that same moment someone's reliving that experience there's another 23 year old kid that that's standing in the front row and and having the greatest music moment of their life. And then that's gonna happen again the next night. And and I, I think that's been happening probably for for Since Frank Sinatra. Yeah. has provided a place where you could make mistakes, be hated, be loved, be ignored, then come back just because it's within your right as a magical human being to do so. You make your last stand in Eden, and this is Eden.
dreamt of a days gone by. We spoke of a comic kaleidoscope and the pros and the cons is in. And he spoke and he said to fall a piece of cake. He really ain't ever yet. Papa Dylan, he said the man don't have to broken our glass in his hand. And a tune is set in a white lace looking cool with a black lace fan. Oh, what goes on? Push it too hard, push it on 